Thanks a lot for this invitation. And I just want to apologize that I won't be able to attend the, the full event. So I'll try to do my best, but I'm following another conference at the moment. So, uh, so yeah, I went, just wanted to apologize. So uh, yeah, as Alessia mentioned, I will talk about inequalities in human mobility. So it's a very generic title. Of course, I, I don't intend to go, uh, I mean, to tackle all, all of uh, all of the types of uh, inequalities, but today I've chosen to, to speak about two, two projects on which I have been working and on different aspects of uh, inequalities in human mobility. So the starting point is that uh, everyone moves uh, in, a, uh, in a different way. And somehow, if we, uh, if we think about urban planning, uh, for instance, it's uh, necessary to understand how different people move uh, uh, differently. So uh, our people with different socioeconomic status move differently or people with different gender move differently. And here the two projects I will mention. So uh, the first one would be about uh, gender gap uh, in urban mobility. And then the, the second one would be about looking at the differences uh, uh, by socioeconomic um, factors in human mobility during a crisis. So here during, uh, during COVID. So here would be the two aspects of uh, inequalities that would be uh, presenting in this, uh, in this talk. So the first one uh, about gender and mobility is a project that uh, involved uh, many partners. So we had uh, Telefonica on board for uh, the mobile phone data. Uh, we had uh, UNICEF to, uh, in GovLab to help uh, defining well the, the question, then to be able to think in terms of policy making afterwards. Uh, and this was uh, funded by uh, an initiative of the UN that is, uh, that is data to x so uh, basically, the, the main question we wanted to uh, to understand, to to answer, uh, if there were any difference, gender differences in mobility. So the fact is that this this question has been answered already in the literature, but there is not uh, really a consensus, and we'll see that it really depends on the on the on the context. And in our case, we will look at Santiago in Chile. And so the fact in the literature, you can find that. Yes, there are gender differences in mobility. Uh, women move more, so because they do uh, um, they do uh, change trips, uh, they are uh, also taking care of the child and so on. You can also find in uh, the literature that yes, they move more, they move uh, differently than men, but they move less. And finally, you can also find that uh, in some study they said there is no difference. So clearly, you see that it's a very tricky qu question and that it's going to be context dependent. And in our case, we were interested in Santiago and we can see in our case, our mobile phone data can be used to do this. So we gathered different uh, data sources. So we had uh, uh, mobile phone data, the call detail records, uh, as I mentioned before. We also gathered some uh, open data about uh, public transportation and also some, uh, some census data. Um, okay, so the period of study we had was uh, three months in 2017, uh, so it was during a normal time, let's say, no external uh, crisis like COVID. Uh, it was uh, data set about 200 million of calls, and of course we had to make a selection of uh, uh, users, and so I won't go into details of the, of the selection, but we had some requirements uh, in order to have uh, uh, good data, let's say. And uh, the nice thing is that not only we had the gender uh, in these call detail records, but we also had access to the uh, uh, some socioeconomic groups of the of the users. So um, we, as I said, we wanted to look at the differences in mobility by gender. So we looked at very standard metrics. And when, when you look at this type of data, so we looked at the British of duration, we looked at the chain of uh, chain and entropy, where the probability we are using is the fraction of calls that are made by a user in a given location. We also looked at the number of visited locations by a user, and then we also took the, only the 80% of the activity in order to see what were the main places that the user visited. Uh, and so we looked at this, uh, uh, these metrics and uh, we could uh, make several conclusions. So uh, the first one is that when you look at the distribution of the radius of duration, you see that 
uh, women tend to stay in uh, in smaller uh, area, and this was uh, of course statistically significant. So this was the first thing I uh, think we could we could see. Uh, another thing that was uh, uh, that we observe is that uh, looking at the both the number uh, of location and then the um, the uh, mean probability of visiting the different uh, location, um, so everything. Uh, based on the call detail records, we've seen that women are, are more localized and they also do less uh, less trip than um, than than men. So here we we can see that there are differences. Some of these differences were already observed by uh, looking also at survey, but it's nice to see they are confirmed by looking at uh, mobile phone data. And then, as I said, we also looked at the entropy. So where uh, we use the, um, this probability of um, uh, doing a call in a given location. And we've seen that women entropy was uh, lower uh, for uh, women, not for men. So here it means that, uh, again, that women tends to be a bit more uh, uh, localized. And so uh, the fact is that then we wanted to understand how this behavior was distributed in the city of Santiago. So uh, here what you see was for uh, the whole city of Santiago. But we wanted to understand what could explain some of these, uh, uh, these differences uh, in mobility by, by gender. So we computed uh, gender mobility ratio. So basically we took each of these four metrics I mentioned. So uh, for instance, we took the, the entropy and we computed the, for each uh, neighborhood of the, of the city, we uh, computed the ratio between uh, the metric measured uh, only on uh, women and uh, uh, over the metric measured on only considering men. And um, uh, we could uh, then, uh, of course, plot a distribution and see what was the, the behavior. But what uh, we were interested in was the, uh, the distribution in the city. So here, what you see is a map of Santiago with the different uh, neighbors, comunas, so as they are called. And you can see on the left, uh, on the left side. So this is basically uh, the woman-to-man ratio of visited location. So again, this is the number of visited location computed using the call detail records. And, and then uh, what you see is that you see some kind of spatial segregation in there. So you see that basically at the, at the um, uh, north uh, east of the, of the city, that, uh, that tends to be uh, less, um, um, less differences between men and, uh, and women. And the striking thing is that if you do a similar map, but this time looking at the proportion of low income uh, Resident, uh, you see that it's somehow echoing what you are seeing for uh, for the uh, this gender gap that we are seeing in the in the mobility. So clearly, um, uh, special patterns of gender gap in mobility are highly correlated with special uh, patterns of social inequality. Of course, this is just a visual uh, uh, consideration, but we also made some analysis. Uh, and uh, so I won't cite here all the analysis we made, but basically we could see a very good correlation between this entropy ratio and, uh, and, uh, and income. And basically we see that as income increase, uh, differences in travel behavior between men and women decrease. So clearly there is a, uh, an interplay uh, between these two things. And then uh, of course uh, you might ask, uh, if uh, a woman and men have the same access to transportation, and if these differences we see are also driven by uh, uh, differences in access to transportation. So this is why we collected uh, this transportation that I was mentioning. So these data are just about the, um, uh, the different lines and their different scale. So it's just about, it's not about the traffic, it's really about uh, the, the structural um, uh, information about the network and of course the timing. And, and basically, we see that we had only slightly negative correlation in the gender gap. So the gender gap we observe is not really linked to, uh, uh, to the public uh, transportation, to the access to public transportation. Um, so what we've seen basically, so here uh, in this plot, you have uh, that each of the points describe uh, uh, one, uh, one cell in a, that is about one kilometer by one kilometer in, uh, in the city. And this is a cell where there is an access to public transportation. 
uh, or no access, and we look if there is access to transportation or not. And then you see on the left side, you see for women, uh, what is uh, what is happening for uh, the different cells, and then on the on the right, every time you see if you have uh, GTFS, it means you have access to transportation. And basically, so just the, the idea you have to get from uh, these plots is that access to public transportation increases the mobility, but does not fill the, the gender gap. So uh, this is not enough to explain what's uh, happening. Of course, we've seen that what was happening was also linked to the uh, to the income, and uh, then what we did and that I didn't put here because I would like to speak about the other project is that if you look at the interplay between the uh, the income and the um, and access to public transportation, you see that basically uh, for men, uh, if uh, you don't have such difference between uh, different socioeconomic uh, um, uh, start status, while for uh, women, you, you see this difference is very pronounced. So basically you see that, uh, yeah, what I said, that access to public transportation does not uh, a lot to uh, to fill to fill the gap that we also observed that is linked to the differences uh, in socioeconomic uh, uh, groups. Okay, so this was for the uh, for this first project uh, where uh, basically what we conclude uh, with this is that we could clearly see that uh, gender inequalities uh, can be uh, could be captured by mobile phone data. Uh, women women were uh, clearly more localized than than men, and this is partly explained by uh, uh, oh partly explained at least there is a. a very high correlation with the distribution of uh, uh, income, while the access to public transportation doesn't seem to be uh, helping so much the differences in mobility we are observing. So if you're interested there, uh, yeah, I shared the link about, um, about the paper. And of course, if you have more questions about this, uh, I would be happy to answer. Now I would like to switch to a second study that also used mobile phone data and uh, so in this seven uh, study, so the type of mobile phone data was uh, was different. In the first one, we used call digital records, while in this seven one, we used uh, data from Cubic, that is a, a, a location intelligence company, and that uh, basically uh, share the um, the GPS coordinates of. Uh, uh, of uh, users, uh, of course, uh, everything com GDPR compliant, and uh, uh, and this is uh, something where the user have to uh, uh, has the possibility to to opt out. Of course, okay. So uh, our objective was during the crisis, uh, during the, the um, uh, COVID pandemic, we started right away to monitor the mobility using uh, using this data. So uh, we uh, uh, right away wanted to look at the long range mobility uh, during COVID, uh, short range mobility and spatial uh, proximity. I would explain uh, how we, we computed these different uh, metrics through the, through the use of this uh, identified uh, location data. And we started this, uh, if you're interested, we had uh, this website that we made at the very beginning of the pandemic, because it was March uh, 2020, and uh, we, uh, we were looking at what was happening, what was happening in the different uh, provinces of uh, of uh, Italy, mo monitoring these uh, different uh, uh, metrics of mobility. Uh, uh, yeah, so this was for what happened at the very beginning. But then we wanted to understand what what happened during different phases of the uh, of the pandemic, and with respect to the different type of uh, uh, intervention, so non pharmaceutical intervention that were done. So basically, we restricted the the set of users to which we have access to, uh, to those users that were present uh, during. Um, the uh, the pre lockdown. So I'm speaking about the first lockdown in 2003. So the pre lockdown, the lockdown, and what is called the phase two. That is basically when things started to uh, slightly uh, slightly reopen. So we wanted to see how mobility was changing during these different phases, and how uh, we could explain uh, these differences in mobility uh, by looking at some socioeconomic factors. So uh, these users we selected, as I say, are present for the whole uh, period, and still, even though it's only uh, only, but still, it's a, it's uh, it's not solo lambda number, but we have forty thousand users. It 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 corresponds to uh, three hundred millions of uh, location with an accuracy that is between fifty and one hundred meters. 
so as I said, these are all anonymized users. We have opted to provide access to their location data. This is anonymous, GDPR compliant. You, you will never single out uh, identifiable, uh, ident identifiable sorry, individuals. Uh, and then we don't have demographic information like we had, for instance, for uh, uh, the uh, first mobile phone that I described with the quality records, and we also have no health information. So it's strictly about the mobility. So we compute also the radius of uh, observation to look at the, uh, the short-range mobility and the spatial proximity. So for the spatial proximity is uh, uh, something also in the spirit of uh, some of the works that uh, Esteban Moro did, uh, where basically uh, on the same kind of uh, on the same kind of data, where basically we, um, as a proxy for spatial proximity, we looked at people who were in the same uh, time interval of one hour with a range of uh, 50, 50 meters, and we built a network out of this. So two person that, uh, that stayed in in uh, the same area of 50 meters, um, I mean, area with radius of 50 meters for one hour were considered to have been collocated. So it's just a proxy to uh, measure the spatial proximity. So we looked at these two, uh, two metrics. And as I say, we wanted to understand how uh, these two metrics, so our mobility changes with the different phases that are the pre-lockdown, the lockdown, and the phase, uh, the phase two. So you can look at it globally, nationally, what happened. So uh, the behavior is uh, uh, kind of expected. You have a sharp decrease uh, uh, during, the, during the lockdown, both for the degree that we measured on, uh, on the spatial proximity network I described, and also on the reduced subjugation. You can also observe some self-induced behavior change that is interesting because you see that even during pre-lockdown, people are starting to move uh, a bit uh, a bit less. And when you finally see that phase two, uh, you have an increase, uh, but you are not going back to the, yeah, to the uh, baseline level, you have an increase in the, in the mobility. So uh, this is what happened at the national level, but uh, of course we wanted to go uh, uh, deeper into this and understand a bit more what was happening at the, at the, at the region level, at the province level. So uh, here we can see a map of the relative change of the average, average radius of generation during the three phases I mentioned. And you see that basically you have kind of, I mean, you have quite a, 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 some uh, heterogeneous behavior across uh, the provinces. So it's interesting because the restrictions were uh, basically the same for all the provinces, but still the response uh, to, to this in terms of mobility was very different. For lockdown, this is a bit more uh, homogeneous, but still you see some heterogeneity. And phase two is the same thing. So uh, the same rules for everyone, but still you see there's differences in uh, uh, in behavior. And so we wanted to understand by looking at socioeconomic factors how we could explain uh, this uh, heterogeneity. So we gathered different socioeconomic features at the province level. So we gathered some demographic um, uh, quantities like the percentage of female, the old age, old age index, uh, the level of education, population density. Also, we gathered some uh, economic uh, features like the average income, or uh, uh, the percentage of people working in different sectors, like people working in uh, industry, agricultural services. And then we also gathered some uh, epidemiological quantities such as the, the attack rate. Uh, and then we wanted to uh, try to use these uh, features in order to explain these differences we were seeing uh, in mobility. So what we did uh, is, uh, um, uh, basically, that for uh, each uh, each day and each phase, we uh, made uh, a mixed effect model. So that is basically a regression uh, model, where we wanted to see what was uh, um, the importance of each of the socioeconomic factors I was mentioning to explain uh, the differences in mobility we were seeing. So on the top, what you see is the um, the distribution uh, uh, for each day uh, um, of the pre-lockdown, for instance, for one week, uh, you see the, uh, the distribution of the um, variation with respect to the baseline of the radius of, uh, of duration. So here you have uh, one, uh, 
one distribution for each of the day, and this is a distribution across the provinces. And then on the top, uh, you see uh, the importance of each, uh, each of the coefficient to explain the differences uh, you see. So for instance, you see that uh, uh, unemployment that is uh, uh, always positive uh, is, uh, seems to be um, correlated with a uh, higher, uh, higher reduction. And uh, yeah, you see that uh, um, Industry is also collected is also uh, correlated with uh, a stronger reduction uh, in mobility during during lockdown, and the same thing for services during phase two. So this can be explained partly by the fact that uh, only some um, I mean not all the services were uh, open. So for instance, uh, restaurants were still closed uh, during phase two, even though there was a lift uh, of the of the restriction. So here, more or less, what we could see, uh, if I try to uh, wrap up what we see on, on, on this slide, is that the distribution of the workforce is, uh, could explain most of the variation we are seeing across the provinces. Uh, we did the same. So uh, here, I, I just show this part, but we did this for really the whole period. So uh, I mean, I'm showing just one week for each of the of the phase, but uh, if you're interested, I can show also what happened for uh, the different uh, uh, different weeks uh, uh, of these different phases. And we also looked at different uh, um, resolution levels. So we looked at the, what was happening at the at the neighborhood uh, level in different cities. So in order to have representative data, we have chosen a, a city with a population um, uh, high enough. So we took Turin, Milan, and Roma. And uh, we looked at also the variation uh, in that case of the, uh, uh, the degree. So in the spatial proximity network I measured. And uh, we could see that uh, Turin and Milan exp experienced an early decline uh, bef even before uh, even, even before the lockdown. And then the other interesting thing, of course, is this heterogeneity you get across the city in terms of reduction of, uh, of, the, of the degree. And you see that there is a stronger reduction in the most, uh, in the most central district. So again, as for the province level, we wanted to understand by using some socioeconomic factors how to explain these differences uh, in mobility. So in that case, in, uh, in spatial proximity. And so we did the same thing. So here you see for uh, all the three periods together, on top you see the uh, evolution of the degree with respect to the, to the baseline um, for, uh, for the whole country, but you see that this is on each day the distribution across. Uh, the different uh, uh, the different neighborhoods, and uh, uh, and for the neighborhood we had access to the level of education, percentage of female, uh, percentage of residential building, and population uh, density, and uh, basically what we could see is that there was not such a differences across the different phases. Like uh, while for uh, the uh, provinces we could really observe a different behavior. I mean, a different, not a different behavior, but of course we had a different behavior, but uh, observe that different socioeconomic factors could explain what happened, what was happening during the different phases. Here you see that for the spatial proximity uh, network at the level of the neighborhoods, uh, at the uh, level of education seems to be explaining most of what we were, uh, what we were seeing uh, that was happening. So basically a higher education was positively, positively associated to reduction in, uh, in mobility. And another striking thing is that we've seen that the higher proportion of women appear to be negatively associated with the reduction. So this is quite striking because if you go to look at survey, uh, that looks at compliance, where it has been seen that women tend to be more compliant uh, with respect to the uh, rules that were put in place uh, during the during the pandemic. But it seems that is uh, so. This is not something you can see the mobility. So it doesn't mean that women are not compliant, but um, for uh, for sure we see that it's uh, it's. Uh, Positive, negatively associated with uh, with the with the reduction. So uh, overall, with this work, we've seen that there was a desertification of city center in large uh, urban areas. That what we were the heterogeneity we were seeing across provinces uh, could be uh, partly explained by the distribution of the labor mar market, and then uh, that the uh, demographic factor like all age index. Uh, were uh, also positively associated to uh, to the reduction, and uh, and uh, uh, 
So the, the really the main uh, the main conclusion of this is that there is really an important role of uh, socioeconomic factors linked to labor structure. Uh, um, that uh, we see that they somehow shape the, the response we, we get in terms of uh, mobility. So here also you can, uh, uh, if you're interested, you can see our, uh, our paper. Um, and the data we used uh, are, uh, are uh, available. I mean, of course, we shared them at an aggregated level. So, but these are the data we we used for the paper, just just to show that we can still have some conclusion by uh, looking at uh, aggregated uh, data, even though we started from the raw one. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators for this work. So, uh, and also I would like to thank uh, Cubic that uh, provided the, the data. And finally, uh, thank you, uh, Paul, uh, for uh, listening. And I'd be happy to take any, any question. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you, Letitia, for that interesting presentation. Uh, so yeah, so there are a few questions here on the chat. So probably we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, so I guess uh, what I'm gonna try to do, I, I got a, I got two questions. So I'm probably gonna try to bundle one of the questions that I have with one Emanuele has asked on the chat, uh, which is a question related to the first paper that you presented uh, yeah. and it's regarding biases. Yeah. So normally when, when we use a uh, mobile phone data, so uh, we get a location, uh, a timestamp, right, on the, yeah. recorded in the data. Uh, and usually we don't get any population attributes. Uh, so my question is, so whether did you have to infer the population attributes or they were taken from uh, other records uh, from the mobile phone company? So so do you um, mean the gender or what kind of pollution? Exactly, yeah, so, so the, gender in particular. So the gender was directly provided. Right, so it, it's, I guess, is uh, so it's part of the contract, so it's provided who is using the mobile phone, no? Exactly, exactly. So it could be that the owner could be different from the, so the actual person using the mobile phone could be different from the person on the contract. Yeah. yeah, so in order to limit this problem, what we've done is that we took only user who had only one line that is registered. Uh, so that raises, I mean, this, uh, so this should limit the, the problem, let's say. Of course, if we have a one, one person who have two registered line might be more problematic. So of course, this can still exist, but I think this, limit, this limits quite a bit uh, the problem. Right. So I guess following up here, so Emanuele question. Uh, so he's asking, uh, so if I'm not mistaken, the analysis is based on calls. Uh, however, the way we interact with mobile phone nowadays is more diverse than that. So using apps, data usage, and so on. So does it, does this introduce any bias in the analysis? So yeah, it's a very good question. So indeed, so uh, one thing is that you are looking at calls. So call behaviors is, is really important. So, uh, I mean, whatever you do, everything you will are look, I mean, you are still looking at calls. So, you, so what we've done in any case is that we've done some stratification, for instance, for different kind of behavior, like uh, on the, for instance, based on the number of calls or based on the time of course. And we see that, uh, we've seen that our, our results remain the same. So even though we were like, so we are trying to put, let's say, uh, same kind of behavior in terms of, uh, same kind of call behavior together, and you see that this still holds. So it's true that it's important to take into consideration that women and men by, might have a different uh, uh, calling behavior. Uh, but say, you, so what we did is basically stratify uh, in order to see if things uh, were still holding. But uh, so this uh, also solves part of the problem, but of course you are looking at, you're not look, I mean, this is the usual problem with mobile phone data. I mean, the usual uh, bias, uh, the, you are still looking at calls. So you can do many tests to see how robust are your result, but this remain calls, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, so, and I guess the last question, uh, if we can answer very, quickly, so from Sanat, uh, so how did you check, so this is referring to the second paper that you presented, mm -hmm. uh, so how did you check that access to pharmaceutical, I guess, is it PT, uh, no, it's not pharmaceutical intervention, is it? 
and its effects on mobility. So I don't know, Isana, if you wanna if you wanna add what the PT abbreviation is. And maybe, totally sure. uh, public maybe transportation. This can be okay. Yeah, so we, we probably need to jump on the other. So, so you're meaning, so what was the question exactly? So how did you check the access to PT? Uh, I, I know so exactly to transportation. What. So as I said, so I'm trying to go to the slide. So we gathered, uh, uh, so this is for the first project. Yeah, I mean, because this is the, the gender one instead, not the... I think it's the second project, but probably what uh, we may need to do is uh, if uh, Leticia, if you don't mind uh, so replying the questions or, or taking them offline and replying in on the Q&A sure, box, sure. Uh, because I, I think we need to move to the next presentation. So okay. over to, to you, Danny. Uh, 